Hey, I have a question for you today. Is your future nimble? We are going to find out today with Gary Mottershead. How are you doing today, Gary? Gary, I'm excellent. Great to see you. And thanks for setting all this up for us. I'm really, really looking forward to this. Listen, man, when we finalize this uh, cover, this title, uh, give us some, give us some backstory. What is the book about? Well, you know, maybe a little background might be helpful on this in that, um, you know, I've been thinking about it for a long time. As you know, if you read the story, I've been coaching entrepreneurs for more than 25 years and I've been in business, you know, probably 40 years, but 25 years in this business. So when 2020 came, I thought, isn't this kind of cool? You know, you know, can we can we look forward, look back, looking at eyesight 2020? And I thought, well, hindsight to foresight. I said, what could we learn from our last 20 years? We could apply the next 20 years because my business was 20 years old. It was 20 2020, all those things that made sense. Yes. And I go, this is great. So start writing the book and bam. Uh, <laughs> pandemic. Well, yeah, the pandemic kind of hit us in China first because I deal with China. And, uh, but we didn't, I didn't think it, I, were, I was coming out of it. I'd already been shut down for two months by the time we got going. And then we got going for a couple of weeks and it shut down again. And I said, oh crap, what are we going to do? Yes. So I said, I'm in the, I'm halfway through. I'm going to finish it. So I finished writing the book because I really felt that and I really appreciate how the title came about because we've always been fighting a battle. Anybody who pays any attention to what's happening geopolitically, yes. in China and the U.S., uh, deal what's happening in, um, in supply chain and transportation and all the issues that go on, dealing in other cultures, which I've had a chance to do. So it just became one. I said, well, what have we learned? How have we managed all of this? And how have we brought our entrepreneurs? How have I brought my team along through this? And I said, well, I wrote a book earlier. You, know, you can see the name of behind called Guan Chi, and it was about when she's a trusted relationship, and the expression for a trusted relationship in Mandarin. And so that was about the past. And I said, well, how can I help this next generation think about what's going on? And as we know from things like abundance and other areas, the f- future gets faster than we think. Um, but I said, you know what? We're still humans. There's only so much we can take in. So how can we take in the information that's important for us and still stay relevant, stay current, and still be excited about the future? Oh, that's so good. Well, and Gary, you are a fantastic coach, and we have a lot of people jumping in. This is going out to Facebook. It's going out to LinkedIn, YouTube, multiple channels, X. You know, we only have uh, the users here, the viewers on one one uh, being calculated here, but literally there could be hundreds that watching now and certainly on the replay. So you have had this amazing coaching gift. In fact, before I even knew you were a coach, I was, uh, I'll never forget, I was on a... Uh, breakout group with you and i thought this guy is really a good coach um you know we were in a breakout group and i thought he's just a good coach he's asking questions and he's showing up filled up and then i thought and then i found out you were a strategic coach associate coach which i love the fact that they make the associate coaches be real business leaders real entrepreneurs so maybe give us a little bit of that history. Like how did your relationship with coach start? And then like, why did you say, look, I want to devote part of my time, not just to my business, but also to coach entrepreneurs too. Yeah, that's, that's, that's really, I'm, I'm glad you bring that. It's really kind of interesting because I uh, was in business. I had a tire recycling business and nobody knows anything about that very little. And so I find at a Christmas party one time that my wife is part of the Exxon group and and the person there says, oh, you're an entrepreneur, Gary, you got to go to strategic coach. This is back in April of 19. This is back in December of 1990. So I met Dan in April of 1991. So almost 33 years ago. Wow. And and then I said, well, I'd worked for DuPont. I'd worked for the Exxon organization. And now nobody's teaching me anymore. I'd go to courses, you know, uh, yeah. selling all those courses. I'm on my own. And so I go, I get introduced. I go to an intro presentation with Dan in April of 91 and i go man this guy's either really crazy or is really onto something because i think like he does <laughs> great crossover of crazy things and i said and then i said maybe it's probably both and so i said all right so i signed up i went started in november of 1991 because i needed help and uh i went to my first two workshops and say oh this is great i missed my third one they wondered whether i was ever coming back again but yeah somehow susan aldrich who was there at the time convinced me and i came back and and i stuck with it because Dan talked about the future and he really, uh, and I resonated with what that was about and nobody else was really talking like that. Mm. And so let's spin the story down is I never asked to be a coach. I was 
asked, well, I shouldn't say, I never, I never asked the question, could I be a coach? I didn't know what was there. I kept thinking about it. And then when they said, well, why don't you come and help facilitate at these big tables? And I remember sitting at a table one day in Chicago and Dan turns to me and says, how would you like to be a coach? I go, wow. I was always wondering what it'd like to be on the other side of the table, you know, and when you wow. should be, be on the other side. And, and that started, and that started the process. Um, and they asked me, and of course, without knowing anything, I said, yes. And I said, what's this going to be? And so in August of 1996, I got two workshops, one on a Wednesday, one on a Friday. Um, those were my first two workshops. Uh, and what was uh, the part that I wanted to bring up was that I had to think about how could I stand in, how could I stand in front of the room with people I've been sitting with all this time? Ooh, that's good. And so I went back in my life and said, well, what have I done? And I could go back maybe till I was 17. And I remember being on the phone, talking to people, um, helping them through. I learned at that point in time, you can only help people who want to be helped. Um, if they don't want to be helped, then that's not, it's not people I can really work with. Yes. Um, but I went through my life to say all these things that I'd never been paid to coach, but I'd actually been doing those things outside because I'm a, I'm a chemical engineer by training. None of that stuff was ever you know, in your world. Um, and I said, so I had to, why about reinterpreting your past? That's exactly what I did. I went back and reinterpreted my past to be able to say, this is why I could be in a coaching position to be comfortable and, and somewhat confident of being up there. So that's, that's so awesome. good. That is so good. Well, listen, if the world's foremost entrepreneur coach, Dan Sullivan, turns to you and says, how would you like to be a coach with my company? That's that's got to be a, a a good day. Yeah, it was it was, you know, um, and I always when I looked at it, I said, this is awesome. I don't know how long it's going to last and what's going to happen. But uh, here it is. 28 and getting into my 29th year later, more than 3000 people. Uh, I just finished doing two workshops in Toronto uh, the last two days and, uh, you know, 60 people over those days. They're exhausting, but really invigorating to see how people, the changes they make, what they, I mean, that's what I get excited about how, and that's why I ask the questions, Carrie. I mean, I'm just there as the, as the sounding board, the way to bring things out in people, because I believe you have the answers. Oh, I yeah. I don't know you have the right questions to ask to get at the answer. Oh, so good. Oh, that's Tanisha. That's quotable. That is quotable. Say that one more time about the questions and the answers. What yes. I, I, I believe, I believe you, all the clients have the answers, but they don't know the questions to ask to unlock that answer. Folks, that's the type of stuff you're going to find in, in uh, Gary's book. I mean, this is, this is fantastic. Gary, talk to us about this cover. Cause I know you just immediately just latched onto this cover we provide a mini comps but you thought something about what what is it what, what what is this about this cover speak to you well first of all i think when we when we changed the name from my original sort of working title uh to nimble future that really caught me and and and, and you made a good point we talked about that because that's what what really resonated that's what worked had to work for me yes I had, I had to do that and we still have to do that i mean i don't have a business that's predictable like uh, for example, the the just the other day when the ship hit the bridge in Baltimore, it just cost us a thousand bucks to ship get another shipment in. So like, that's it. Everything that happens in the world ha happens. So being nimble. So when the term caught to us, um, I love blue. By the way, that's my blue color. I got blue eyes, and so blues so it kind of stuck with me. Blue. But uh, what really intrigued me was the hand holding the globe kind of upside down, because you don't. The world is not straightforward all the time. And, and, it, and it, it just made me look into that picture and say, it's a, there's more depth to that. There's more intrigue to that. And that's why I feel about our lives. There, there's a lot there, but we have to look deeper into it sometimes to be able to see all of that. And so it just caught me and it's really striking. So uh, I really appreciate what we, when we looked at different ways, all different things we looked at that was really striking to get to. Me. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Listen, so much goes into a book. It's a huge sacrifice it really is uh for the author um uh, and yet it's an eternal asset you know like think about it i'm being mentored by people that have written books decades ago so it lives on it lives on beyond you it's a legacy piece and i think because of that some people don't want to write a book because they feel like there's a lot of pressure uh and yet here you are and i think it's a great contribution to the world Gary, you probably get it. I, I know you get these questions because when you're successful, people 
email you, strangers, and they say, Gary, can I pick your brain? And, you know, the first time you get one, you're, 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 you're flattered. The hundred and first time you get one, you, you got to realize you need a filtering process. And so now when people say, Gary, can I pick your brain rather than them being trying to afford your amazing coaching rate, which is like, you know, astronomical and it should be because the value create now they can literally buy a book and get your best thinking. I've heard that nonfiction books are the densest form of uh, information that somebody can digest. But like, let's unpack this back cover copy for, for a second. So nimble, adapting, um, talk to us a little bit, pull out anything you want from this, including some of the-, the uh, Yeah, I wanna, I, wanna say, I wanna say something too that I think was important for the background is when I started writing it and um, then I finished in, in in the middle of 2020, I let it sit for two years, two and a half years. Interesting. And and the reason I let it the reason I let it sit was that we were going through COVID. We had to figure out what our world was going to be, how everything was going to unpack. And then even my wife, our anniversary was April of 2020, 40th anniversary, and so we'll go away at Barbados. And we that got I paid for it, of course, two weeks before everything shut down. And so we finally got it in November of 2022. And the reason why that was significant because I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure how well this was going to stand up. Mm. And so I, when I finally read it, my last day that I was down there, and I said, because I carried this manuscript down with me, I read it over and I said, if it doesn't stand the test of time in the last couple of years, it doesn't need to be published. It stays where it is, and we pack it away, and, and it goes. And as I say in my notes, I was really pleasantly surprised that it made, it made more sense. And what we've seen since then, and I like what's on the cover of it, is that if anything, the last few years have taught us that uncertainty is going to continue. Yes. And I just realized that that's a world that I've lived in. And I was I was accepting it, but a lot of other people haven't haven't accepted it. So, I'm with all the information that can come to us now. I've always gone several years develop filters. You talked about filters. I've developed filters for myself, and that. And that I don't, not that I don't stay up to date, I consider myself to be quite current on top of things, but I don't have to take everything in. I look mm -hmm. it through and say, what am I looking for? So we went, you, I know you were down at Abundance, I was at Abundance, and so much information comes firing at you. I said, what am I looking for? Well, I look, up, I look for specific things. And one of the most specific things that came out, because we've been playing with AI for more than a couple of years, was that you have to treat AI like a child. Latch on to that. So now you teach it. I said, why do you always have to say please and thank you to it? Because it learns. Well, fortunately, I've got two grown children, now a couple of grandchildren. We see how they learn and say, good. Now, there's no fear about AI. There's no fear about technology because I put it into a context that we can all live with. And so, whereas uncertainty and um, brings that fear, we call it, mm -hmm. but growth also brings, as we say in coach, fear, uncertainty, and discomfort. And if you're going to grow, you got to be able to live with those things. But you got to be able to take in information in such a way that it doesn't overwhelm you and, sure. and paralyze you. So that's that's kind of a simple. That's, that's so that. good. That's so good. Talk to us about this. Um, I'm going to start in the reverse order because this one just popped out at me. But uh, Nimble Future will teach you how to protect and nurture your greatest asset, your belief. Did you see a lot of people's belief get shaken? And oh. uh, yeah, yeah, and, and even today, mm. you know, I'm we as again just to finish the last couple of days. Is that when I asked people what their biggest complexity was, is that some of them said my own self belief. Ah, and these are successful entrepreneurs, and so well, you know very much. You're a man of faith as well, and so you know you. Ha I've always believed, and I've had to believe in something else other than me. But also, I do know when you're when you're we're all on our own in some respects, but we work together with a team and particularly in entrepreneur is you yes. have to believe in yourself. And the old expression is it's not how many times you get knocked down because that's going to happen. It's how many times you get back up yeah. and you don't get back up if you don't believe, because I can't tell you how many times they told me, Gary, you can't work with China. They're going yes. to they're gonna steal from you. They're, they're going to sell you crap and everything else is going to go down there. Well, um, I got them to sell to me and not pay them till I could afford to pay them. Uh, I've worked with them for 27 years and had good friends. And I recognized they wanted the same thing that we wanted to. So it's all for the people's motivation. So if you don't believe, it's never going to happen. Wow. Never wow. Happen. 
Listen, man, there's people weighing in from all over the, I, I knew this was going to be a big one, but you have Gary's the, the goat. I love it. I love it. You have uh, Mary who said, look, um, your style and approach. I think you have this um, calming yet, um, you know, a coach, a coach, in my opinion, a good one. I mean, you have all types of coaches, but you have this calming yet searing truth style. Which again, like I don't, not everyone wants this abrasive in your face, gonna butt beat you up, coach. How do you, what formed your approach? I'm to me, I'm down to earth and, and it's got to be real. I, I don't, I've never been involved in a lot of hype. I'm an engineer by training. And in my, what's good about that is that things work or they don't work. There was no BS about it, you know, yeah. it, so you couldn't, you couldn't. You know, it wasn't bullshit baffles brains because we have a product. It's got to be meet a specification. It's got to work or it doesn't work. That black and white nature of the world we live in, coupled with the uncertainty of how they're dealing with the people, has really formed what what I've had to work with. Because wow. I just and so we got to be real. And yeah. I learned really interesting when you work with people of other cultures, they can read things pretty easily. You know, you really, can, you get, well, you don't use your words anymore. I'm. I mean, body you know, language, body yeah, language. It's body language. And, you know, when I first went to China, the first trip was a social visit. And I said, well, I'm going halfway around the world. I don't have enough money on it. And you're making it a social visit because they want to know, because they want to know they can trust you. They don't necessarily trust their police. They don't necessarily trust their governments, but they want to know they can trust you. And so they yeah. test you. And so you've learned if you're not authentic, I mean, you know this very much, Carrie. If you're not authentic, people read that really, really quickly. Yeah. And I learned that I could not be Dan Sullivan. I knew I couldn't be Dan Sullivan. I can't follow him. I have to be Gary. And so obviously helping coach, I think that's made me more authentic in the sense that, okay, I'll tell people if it's wrong. I can tell people I spent, you know, two or $300,000 doing something that didn't work. So it, these things happen to all of us. So that authenticity breeds a kind of uh, trust and, and belief good. in what goes on. So that's, that's the way I looked at it. That's fantastic. Let's go to your company a little bit because... I do love the fact that, you know, you've mentioned uh, a little bit about GCP. What if somebody meet, meets you on an elevator and they say, what are you doing? Are, is the, are these your main three things? What, what, what do you, what do you do? You know, it's, 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 it's I'm, I'm, I love that. Um, and, and GCP was again, talking about the future. I think it's really important. I, and I, I think I give this in the background too. When I started GCP, I'd been involved in the retire cycling business. And I got out of that business with my shirt, nothing else. You know, people say you sell your business. Yeah, I did, but I, I didn't. I, I fortunately lost $100,000 that they wouldn't pay me, I suppose. Mm. So. But at 45, I have to start all over. So something has to work. And I resisted working with the, the people in China for a couple of years. And uh, what, 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 I, what I learned from, from holding off and doing that is that what I loved the fact was I could see that the wave from China was coming going back 25, 30 years ago. And so like the surfers, they, they paddle till they find, they don't know what's going to be a big wave. They have to paddle and catch a wave. And so I said, all right, you've got, you've got to anticipate what the future might bring. So I said, I think this is coming and let's get this started. And they dealt with recycled rubber. And I said, I, that was still my goal. Uh, I still believe I'm probably responsible for recycling more tires than anybody else in the world. Not having, not having, done all the recycling but setting it all up and i said okay let's continue that process and so that's what got us all started and then from there it was oh they kept asking me if we could do something else and of course i'd always say yes <laughs> sure i can do this i can find it and we just developed a skill and a capability of being able to um source things for companies that they couldn't source themselves and uh at the same time because it's always a dual purpose is the motivation from the people in china is they want to become world-class suppliers Mm. and they couldn't they didn't know how to break out of that so i said okay we'll deal with all of north america it's the biggest market and we'll make you a world-class supplier but this is the way this is the way you have to make things wow you know, this is the specs you have to make and so that that can mutually beneficial long-term relationships is in there the reason why that worked is i worked in their interest our interests and the customer's interests i've always believed in strategic alignment throughout the chain not an adversarial relationship between suppliers and customers but a cooperative relationship. Not everybody still believes that in North America, but I could certainly bring that in, in most of the world we had. So that's how GCP got going. And so, yes, we developed products and then we put names to it. We're the largest importer of industrial sheet rubber into the United States and silicones. 
as well. And um, just simply because we looked after what other people's needs were and we facilitated both of those. So that's what part, part of being nimble is about. So that's so good. Well, listen, you, you, even on launch day, we're being nimble right now. It's, uh, it's leaking into 40,000 channels around the world. It's in uh, Barnes and Noble, ebook, paperback, uh, hardcover is coming soon, audio is coming soon. How much of entrepreneurship do you have to just start? Because I feel like with, you know, you've seen a lot more entrepreneurs in your life than mine, but it sounds like some entrepreneurs maybe never get off the ground because of perfectionism or fear of looking dumb or failure. Like how much of that is in the nimble future uh, that you address? I, you know, and I do address it because the book was originally uh, built around business. And I think the, really the, the one thing that people really get confused at is they have to have this great, wondrous, massive idea. You know, we get taught about what unicorns are now out there, the billion dollar valuations of companies. And I go, no, 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 that's not where it starts. You see what isn't working in a world and then just go and try and deal with it. Uh, and, and so it can start really small. We started with one order for $20,000 and we built it to 20 million, you know, one order at a time. And wow. so it wasn't, it wasn't like we're going to start out at 20 million or 25 or 50 million or whatever it was, but what do you got to do? And I, and I think what's more important for, for entrepreneurs at this stage is don't worry about how big it can be. Don't worry about comparing with somebody else. What problem can you solve? Mine was I wanted to bring more recycled rubber into the world and I wanted to take advantage of what the cost structure could be and how it worked in China and provide the customers an alternative product that they might not have been able to get through their normal supply chains. That was it. And it went one step at a time, one order, one customer, one type of product all at a time. That's it. so good. I think you nailed it a few minutes ago when you said that our world I see, you know, when I go on X Twitter, I see a whole society right now that is not on both sides, all sides. We don't know what's coming. Um, even at the abundance conference you and I were at, how many experts were on stage? And then the question was asked, where is this going? And they're like, we don't know. <laughs> I mean, don't you think that more than ever our world today, you almost have to have a nimble future? I totally. And and I, I want to completely believe that because I think the future is still exciting, by the way. And I don't care. Oh, yeah. I, believe, I think it's still exciting. So lots of opportunity. But we, we have to, in a lot of ways, we have to listen to ourselves. I talk about mm -hmm. trusting our guts, too. We have to listen to ourselves. And there's a reason why we have a gut. There's a reason why we... We do the things that we do and so i got i had to get away from comparing myself to a lot of other people because i've coached some brilliant people and yeah things that they all do and i go well why am i this little guy over here in the corner you know uh, but i realized that's i do what i do and so i think everyone's got to come and, and appreciate what they do wow and but don't get caught up in everything else that's going on out there and understand the information that they need in the world it used to be that way but we have access to so much information today um, we have to, we have to create filters. We have to create boundaries. We have to create barriers in some respects, not to ignore things, but just to only take in what's going to be worthwhile for you. That's so good. Talk to us about some of these other, uh, benefits. I know we talked about belief and, and, uh, I think Dan Sullivan talks about like guarding your confidence. You nailed it with belief. In fact, that was with some university entrepreneurs who are just starting and I said to them yesterday, like the only thing people are buying is your belief because you, you, we can sniff out unbelief. Don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you're in a sales conversation, if, if, if there's any doubt that the person can't deliver, we can, we can sense that. So is this a book that if I had to tell people like, Hey, in one sentence, this book is going to fortify your faith um would you say that i mean yeah, absolutely and i think the faith in themselves interesting. You know, and, and the faith that they can do things because there's so much that's capable and i mean the one thing i wanted to pull out of that you know build values through mutually beneficial long-term relationships don't yeah. just think about yourself oh that's good don't think about yourself because 
entrepreneurs have what we call a fundamental relationship. We got this from coach and that we have to bring value before we get a reward. If you're looking at your rewards, you put the, you put the cart before the horse. Interesting. And so, so hey, if everybody wins, you're going to win. If you bring more value, you're going to get greater returns. And the only way you're going to do that is that learning from your failures, you want to call them failures because we don't, we don't learn unless we have obstacles. We don't grow. It almost feels like as I'm reading uh, and know about you in your book, even the subtitle, reinterpret your past, protect your present, engage in your future. It almost feels like the most nimble wins. What do you think? I, 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 I have, I say also in the book is that I think some of the large institutions and organizations are going to have the most difficulty in the future. Oh, that's good. As you see what's happening with AI, if, if people are afraid of it and don't don't adopt it or don't find a way to adapt to these things, then you know really what's going to happen is those organizations uh, are in trouble. I, I got a cute little piece if we got a moment. Is there was an <laughs> author? He's unfortunately he's passed away, named Douglas Adams, and he wrote the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Now he okay. and I are the same age, but he died in his late forties. Wow. Um, but anyway, so he wrote a trilogy in four parts, which is kind of he's just kind of a cool crazy guy Brit anyway so this one book and I always remember this really clearly and this is going back along you know 25 30 years ago and he said you know what this the earth uh, the planet that everybody was on was imploding and so they said okay we're going to create three big ships we're going to move all the population out so they put all the the executives and chief people in one big ship to go they put all the middle managers in the, in the one and the organizers in another one and they put all the workers in another one and they said, okay, we're going to send all the organizers and middle managers off. So they sent that ship off and the other two went in another direction. <laughs> they said, we're just going to eliminate all these guys from our world. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So I said, you know, that's what's happening to us. That whole de de is taking place. Interesting. Those, those not providing another value are going to be gone. And, and this is a guy that wrote this in his own tongue in cheek way, um, you know, back, you know, 30 years ago or so. It's crazy. Listen, you're dropping value. Uh, our team loves you, by the way. I think here's one of your friends, Travis, but he reinterpreted what you said and said, the nimble win the future. Yeah. I mean, that's that, that's the book. Yeah. yeah. And, and, yeah, and you know, it's come from my whole life because I'm not a very big person. And I've always had to learn to adapt in the world, uh, both physically, mentally, emotionally. And uh, it just got turned into everything I've done in my life. So, so Gary, as we have about two more minutes left, we're, you know, I'm going to do a whole DOS little throw. I'm going to throw it at you here. Okay. Um, so Gary, if we're having a chat three years from now and I say, Hey, what happened with nimble future to made you feel really proud, satisfied like this, this, this helped people. What, what would you say? I would say that, that I've heard from people that this really made a difference to them, that they were able to look at their own lives and say, you know what? crystallize what they needed to do for themselves in the future. I mean, I did say one time, yeah, I'd love to sell a thousand books. And you reminded me only 5% of the authors sell a thousand books. So I kind of said, that's not the number selling. Everything else wasn't that important. And it's never been that important to me. But the fact that those who the message resonates with means something to them and they can utilize this and then hope they pass it on to their friends, pass it on to their children, because even though I'm in my generation, I think the next two or three generations younger than me, that's it's really valuable for them from that standpoint. That's so good. Folks, the book is called Nimble Future, Reinterpret Your Past, Protect Your Present, Engage in Your Future. You can already see Gary's heart. You can, you can feel the wisdom. This book is not theory. It's forged from true experience. He really has uh, his skin in the game. Uh, the business is really becoming uh, and has been an industry leader. And I'm so glad that I met you through Strategic Coach. So Gary, we're dropping links in to get the book. It's available all over the world. And uh, thanks for being here. Well, you know, Travis, you you and your team really made this happen and come about. And uh, I'm, I'm delighted that we got a chance to meet on that virtual workshop that day. And uh, um, we've had a chance to work together. I really, really sincerely appreciate that. Absolutely. And Big shout out to all your friends who, uh, Russell and everybody who's been jumping in. But Gary, thanks so much and enjoy your launch day, my friend. Awesome. Thank you, Travis. Really appreciate it.